change. Now there's a scary word. Change can stress out the best of us and forces us to face an unknown future. But change can also create opportunities. And life has a way of pushing you in the direction you need to go, even when you don't want to, until you realize you're exactly where you always wanted to be. The Starfire Optical Range is where change ultimately pushed me. We are a team conducting research using large telescopes to image objects in space through a turbulent atmosphere. You see, the atmosphere creates a lot of problems. While it provides lots of benefits, like, say, being able to breathe, right? <laughs> looking from ground to space through the atmosphere is like looking down a road on a hot summer's day. That same mirage you see on the road constantly distorts our imaging of space objects. Stars don't actually twinkle. It is our atmosphere that makes them appear to do so. All the way back in 1704, Sir Isaac Newton talked about this limitation on telescopes in his book, Optics. In there, he noted that telescopes cannot be formed as to take away the confusion of the rays which arises from tremors of the atmosphere. Now, what he called tremors, we would today call atmospheric turbulence. In 1953, Horace Babcock published an article titled, The Possibility of Compensating Astronomical Scene. In it, he described a concept for correcting for the effects of atmospheric turbulence that would be realized 30 years later with adaptive optics. And from 1979 to 2006, Dr. Bob Fugate led the team at the Starfire Optical Range and revolutionized the world of astronomy in the process. Over those years, Dr. Fugate's team led the development of three key technologies, large telescopes, adaptive optics, and laser beacons for adaptive optics. Technologies that filled key military needs, but also have been adopted by every major observatory in the world. So how did I get lucky enough to be a part of it? Well, two weeks after graduating from high school, I reported to the United States Air Force Academy. Scary, that actually is me. <laughs> At that time, life was full of uncertainties. But one thing was certain in my mind. I was going to become an astronautical engineer. That's right, I was an astro guy. And that certainty stayed with me all the way until my sophomore year, <laughs> when I took my first astro class and realized that it wasn't what I wanted. <laughs> At the same time, I was taking my first electrical engineering course. I was fascinated by the material, and I had an engaging instructor who cared about us, not only as students, but as future Air Force officers. And so I declared my major in electrical engineering with a focus on communication systems. You see, I wasn't an astro guy. I was a calm guy, and the first major change in my life's path had just occurred. And I got to put those calm guy skills to use during my first active duty assignment, working on satellite communication systems. After several years, I had the opportunity to apply to the Air Force Institute of Technology's master's degree program. I filled out my application and noted my choice of study in the communications program. But they required me to list three choices of study. And so I wrote down the other two electrical pattern recognition guy. <laughs> and I did well in the program, and so several months before graduation, I submitted an application to stay at school and get a PhD in pattern recognition. Two weeks later, my advisor called me in, told me he had only one slot, and I was not his top candidate. I thanked him for his consideration and prepared to go on to my next military assignment. However, two days later, I had a note to see another instructor in the department who I had never met. I went to his office, he told me he'd seen my application, he had a slot and it was mine if I wanted it. Again, you never turn down a free education. So I said, yes! And then I asked him what I'd be studying. <laughs> he said, adaptive optics. I said, that's interesting. What's adaptive optics? And with that, I was no longer a pattern recognition guy. I was on my way to becoming an adaptive optics guy. 
Well, that series of changes in my life's path led to my first assignment at the Starfire Optical Range, where I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Fugate and his team. I was home. I fell in love with the mission, the people, and the technology. I really was an adaptive optics guy. And that made it really hard to leave on my next military assignment. But fortunately, for my last assignment, I was able to return to Starfire. And after retiring from active duty, I was hired back as a federal civilian. So now let's go back to 2006 when Dr. Fugate retired. This was another time of change and uncertainty in my life. Dr. Fugate had led the team for so long and accomplished so much that there was tremendous pressure to live up to his dream. At the same time, the nation was changing its perspective on space. For years, the nation had focused on just keeping track of space objects. Now, the nation wanted to know not only where the satellites were, but what was their mission? What was their status? And are hostile acts occurring? What the Air Force calls space situational awareness. At that point, I was given the opportunity to lead the team in the next evolution of the Starfire telescopes. As I mentioned before, Dr. Fugate's team had led the development of three technologies, large telescopes, adaptive optics, and laser beacons for adaptive optics. Our challenge was to repackage those technologies together and optimize their combined performance to support space situational awareness goals. Initially, we focused on what we'd always considered to be our mission, the high-resolution imaging of low-flying satellites up to 1,500 kilometers above the Earth, with image quality that enables you to determine the satellite's mission. Now, this would be like looking from here in Albuquerque all the way to Los Angeles and being able to determine if a vehicle was a car, a truck, or an SUV. But we also recognize that change can be good, that change can lead to opportunities, and we took a lesson from the astronomers. You see, they had been working to apply these same technologies to the search for planets around other stars. We adopted their techniques to detect closely spaced objects at geosynchronous orbit, 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. At this distance, satellites just look like dots to us. But this would be like looking at a distance 24 times that from Albuquerque to Los Angeles, or the distance an aircraft must fly to circle the Earth and being able to distinguish two satellites separated by only a football field's length. By adding the second mission to our program, we created new challenges and new opportunities for our research and hope to expand the tools available to the Air Force to determine what was happening in the space environment. We began a five-year effort to develop system requirements, design and build subsystems, and then gut the telescope optical path and replace every mount, optic, sensor, and electronics, except for the large primary mirror. In the end, we increased the optical efficiency of the telescope from less than 20% to greater than 70%. We also helped develop the brighter, next generation of sodium guide star lasers seen here. The guide star laser, which can only be seen about a mile from our facility, is used to measure the atmospheric turbulence so that the adaptive optics can compensate. Here's a picture of sodium guide star operations from further away. Isn't that spectacular? That's a Bob Fugate picture. It's amazing. If you follow the beam up and move in closer, you can actually determine exactly which star the laser is pointed at. And if you zoom in even more, you can see the artificial guide star, that yellow blob of light the laser creates in the mesosphere. It is this artificial guide star that is used to measure the turbulence along the imaging path. Now, this combination of changes allowed us to more finely sample the atmosphere in both space and time and enabled us to image objects much dimmer than ever before. For closely spaced objects, there are very few close satellites at geosynchronous orbit for us to test the system. So instead, we test on astronomical objects. One recent discovery is that some asteroids have moons. Because of the changes we made to the Starfire system, we are now the smallest telescope on the planet to have imaged multiple asteroids with moons, as seen here. You have asteroids Roxanne, Calliope, and Sylvia. In each case, you can clearly see the asteroid in the center and the orbiting moon around it. Can you see them all? 
Okay, maybe some of them aren't that clear, but they are there. And this is exactly what we'd expect to see if two geosynchronous satellites moved very close together. In addition to asteroids, we've been able to prove this technique on stars. These pictures represent two binary stars discovered by the Starfire Optical Range over the last year. In each case, the star catalogs listed these as single stars. But because of the changes we made to the telescope, we were able to determine that each star had a companion, which would be like discovering that what you thought was one satellite at geosynchronous orbit was actually two satellites very close together. But the most challenging mission at Starfire continues to be the high-resolution imaging of low-flying satellites because it is so different from what the rest of the astronomical community does with telescopes. When following a satellite from horizon to horizon in under two minutes, the dynamics of the moving telescope create conditions that are unique to this mission. Now I get to show you the results. You're going to see a movie of us imaging a satellite called CSAT. And it begins by showing you what a satellite looks like to our telescope through the turbulent atmosphere without correction. You see the image is blurred and it moves around on our cameras. First thing we do is turn on our tracking system now and lock the satellite's position relative to the camera. And then we turn on the adaptive optics system now. Yeah, and the results are amazing. I never get tired of seeing this, and I'm constantly amazed that I get to be a part of making this happen. But no project like this is ever accomplished by a single person. This is my team, what I consider my second family. It takes over 80 people to do what we do. We are a mix of military, Air Force civilians, and contractors. We have specialties in optics, astrodynamics, mechanical, controls, electro-optics, electronics, software, math, physics, and others. We are operators, maintainers, and facilities people. Most of us do not come to Starfire with a background in telescopes or adaptive optics, but it is that combination of people coming together, taking the opportunity to apply their skills to our challenges that makes something great, and I couldn't do my job without them. I've now been at Starfire for over 18 years, and I wake up every day wondering how I ever got so lucky. Like the changes we made at the Starfire Optical Range that added new capabilities and created new opportunities, I've had to make changes in my life. I don't know where I would be today had I remained an astro guy or a com guy or a pattern recognition guy. What I do know is that multiple times throughout my career, I had opportunities presented to me that required me to change my goals, to change my expectations, and to change at my very core who I was and who I was going to be. Had I not acted on those opportunities, I'd have missed out on the adventure of a lifetime. Thank you.